Welcome to Progenesis webinar. This is session number 20. Today's topic is infertility causes, age, hormones, and genetics. We are very pleased to have an excellent panel of fertility specialists. We, are, we have with us Dr. Clifton. She is the fertility specialist at Invia Fertility Specialist. We have with us Dr. Makowski. She is a fertility specialist at Dallas IVF. And we have Dr. Rivas, his medical director at Punta Mita Fertility Center. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here. Pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Miriam is going to help us moderate the webinar as well. Maria, uh, Miriam, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Very good. Okay, so um, before we start, we have some patients that are going to be asking. Uh, some of them are have submitted their questions and others may be asking live. Uh, the topic is about age, uh, hormones, and genetics. And I'm gonna start my first question with uh, about age. So can you guys tell us how age impacts fertility? And this is again, a basic information for patients to understand. And I'll start just from uh, left to right. So I'll start with you, Dr. Clipson. Um yeah, so age is, I would say, the most important factor that we look at. So when I see a new patient, um, the first thing I look at is the age of the female, because what we know is that fertility goes down with age. Um, and the one thing we can't change is the loss of eggs and the loss of egg quality that has to do with age. So, um, for example, uh, we know that fertility starts to go down in the late 20s, but not very significantly until the mid to late 30s. Um, and then by age 40, every year really is very significant um, until about the mid 40s when it becomes very difficult to get pregnant with your own eggs. So yes, absolutely age is the most important factor. Um, and the first thing we, we try to examine when we uh, assess success rates for patients. Thank you so much. Dr. Mikulski. Absolutely agree with Dr. Klipstein, right? So the big factor with age is that there's nothing we can do to modify it, right? We can't turn back the clock. We can't go back in time and get more eggs. We're born with all our eggs to have and that number just keeps declining as we get older and sadly with that the quality of those eggs diminishes as well so time is really your most precious resource as a patient i cannot agree more i think uh as dr just said every time that we have a new consultation one of the first things that you look at is the age because right right away you can tell you, you will know things about that. So, uh, and this is a very sensitive subject because uh, a lot of patients tell me, hey, and then what is the correct age? You know, I've, I've looked into some of the questions that our community tell you. And one of the things is, when is the correct time to do it? When, when, is that, when, when do I have to jump and do the fertility clinic assessment? So I think, uh, as just Dr. McCulloch, you just said, uh, the age is on the most valuable situation. The younger, the better. And then to establish which is, what age is the best, right? So I think we will continue with that. Fantastic. So. Okay, so when you have a, a, you know, a first visit with the patients, what age do you think is a cutoff where you cannot help them through their own eggs? And you have to say, you know, you have to go for an egg. But is there a specific age that you um, have to set that bar and say, you know, this is the alternative. You have to go for an egg donor, Dr. Clipson. Uh, I think you're yes. a Yes, de definitely. So, um, like I said, fertility declines until the mid 40s. And so there are women um, in the late 40s, you know, the, the Guinness Book of World Records says that the oldest woman to conceive on her own was 58 at the time that she conceived. Um, and so we see that. Um, but if you look at women who have tried to get pregnant and have had difficulty, um, and then you look at what the success rate for them would be with the most successful thing we do, uh, which is IVF, that success rate goes down pretty precipitously. Um, and by the time a woman's 45, the chance of success is under 5%. Um, by the time she's 46, that chance of success is essentially zero. Um, there was a study out of Cornell 
a bunch of years ago now with over 100 women um, above age 45, so 46 and above. Um, and they had a number of cycles and they did find that some women did get pregnant, but all of the pregnancies miscarried. Having said that, there are a couple case reports, one out of India, one out of Italy, of women above age 45 that did get pregnant with IVF, uh, but these are few and far between. And so I would say if someone comes to me at age 45, it's certainly worth a try. If someone comes at age 46, you know, perhaps you could try, but you have to counsel that the chances, um, maybe not zero, but approaching zero. Thank you so much. Dr. Mikoski. I absolutely agree. Um, it's going to be very individualized, right? There is going to be that occasional patient that will have possibility for a, a higher chance of success than say maybe their other 45 year old peers. Um, the other thing that's really important is to really think about what your ideal family looks like. So if you're telling me that you want at least two children and you're coming to me, you know, in your mid forties, it may be, you know, the most beneficial to consider an egg donor in hopes that we have multiple embryos available for not just that first successful pregnancy, but for siblings as well. Excellent. Dr. Rivas, is that your position? Uh, yeah, I have to agree. And there's something Dr. Flipson just said. Uh, there's never the, in, I think, uh, unless other thought, but there's no 0% in fertility and there's not 100%. So, and this is a matter that we really need to connect with our patient because of course, if you're 45 and this is the best moment for you to want to build a family, I cannot ship, I cannot switch the, the, the chip and just tell you go for the egg donation. Either we know that that will be the best route to do it, the patient might have a desire and, and in, in that matter, we need to be very uh, empathetic to, to try to guide them as much as, as we can to, to obviously be successful, but also taking care of that emotion that our patients at that age might be experienced. So yes, of course, the 45, the 46 years old are gonna have the most troubles. But as Dr. Gibson said, there's no zero then there's no rules for a hundred, okay? Yeah, very good. So we have, uh, let's take a live question. Uh, Riley, if you can connect us to our patients. Yes, of course. Um, Natalie, are you there? Yes, hi guys. Hi there, you're Hello. ready to go. Hi. hi, so my question is, um, let me just give you a little background. I am a 39 year old with diminished ovarian reserve uh, specifically, my AMH levels dropped from, in December of last year, they were 0 0.83. And uh, my most recent testing in May showed it dropped 0 0.25. Um, I do have a history, I have been pregnant several times, um, a couple miscarriages when I was much younger. And I've had a fallopian tube removed last April due to a second ectopic pregnancy in the same side. Um, so after I had that removed is when I started going to a fertility uh, specialist. Uh, we've, um, we had a pregnancy spontaneously after doing, you know, an HSG and doing all the genetic testing and blood work. So that pregnancy ended at around seven weeks where um, the embryo failed to, you know, continue to grow. Um, so when we went for our nine week ultrasound, there was no heart rate, heartbeat. Uh, so we had it, uh, we were able to do a DNC and get it tested and it was uh, an extra chromosome. So we've tried to move on and, and we decided to do IVF uh, just because we wanted to do genetic testing since obviously I have a lower um, egg count and I guess the quality goes down as you get lower eggs. Um, or less eggs. Uh, so far, I've had a canceled IVF cycle because the treatment that was very aggressive didn't really work out. I had seven follicles, but they didn't grow sufficiently. And then my other IVF cycle was turned into an IUI um, also because I didn't respond well to treatment. Um, the advice of my doctor is that my, my ovaries are acting older than my age. Um, he feels that the more aggressive treatments aren't working, and then the, the lighter treatment worked a little better, but it, it only resulted in two follicles. So we ended up turning that to an IUI. My question for you guys, after that long drawn out year, <laughs> uh, 
Um, this last IUI, uh, I feel was done in vain. Um, it was two follicles on the right ovary, which is the side where I'm missing the fallopian tube. Um, they had me trigger and they did two days of insemination and obviously intercourse at home, but I feel there was an oversight. I, I'm not sure if you guys know a little more about this. I've had a really hard time finding any information on the success of an IUI when you only have one fallopian tube and the ovary with the follicles is on the opposite side of that one tube. Um, I will start uh, on the same orientation. Let's start with Dr. Clipstein. Yeah, hi, Natalie. Um, thanks for sharing your story. It sounds like you've been through a pretty rough year there. Um, a couple comments. I mean, I think you're absolutely right that um, when the AMH is lower, that's associated, of course, with diminished ovarian reserve, but along with that um, is uh, increased antifluid or increased uh, chromosomal abnormalities. And indeed, um, that's what you found with the miscarriage. And I'm actually very happy you did the chromosomes with the miscarriage because that's really helpful information uh, moving forward. Um, in terms of the uh, ectopic, and, and by the way, there's some data that the pregnancy tissue from ectopics is more likely to be chromosomally abnormal. And so sometimes an abnormal embryo just doesn't know to implant in the uterus. And so, you know, it's hard to know. You usually don't test that tissue, but, um, but that could be what caused the ectopics as well. Um, you know, the question about the right ovary uh, being the one that ovulated the follicles, but that's the side that the tube is missing, is really interesting. And so it's almost like Murphy's Law sometimes that the side that's missing is the one where the ovary is, is more active. And, uh, and so, and, and we have no control obviously over which side uh, produces more follicles. Having said that, um, eggs can travel. So the egg and the tubes are not connected. So the egg from one side can, and we know this happens, travel to the tube on the other side. It's not as common, um, but there is still a chance of pregnancy. And so um, whenever this situation happens, which it happens not that infrequently, unfortunately, um, where the ovulation happens not on the side where the known uh, open tube is. Um, I have a long conversation with patients. I think, you know, it's, it, you could kind of been through the whole IVF cycle. You already have follicles. Um, I think it made sense to at least try to get pregnant with that cycle and not, and not give up on it. Otherwise, you'd have kind of a, a zero chance, right? So I, I think that that was an appropriate um, option, albeit with a lower chance of success than if you had ovulated on the side with the known uh, tube that was open. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Mikulski, can you, in addition of responding, can you tell us if it's medically possible to have a, a transfer in a fallopian tube while the other ovary, the opposite ovary is, is it medical, medically possible? Absolutely. So there have been case reports historically of women who've had a fallopian tube removed for whatever reason, whether that was an ectopic pregnancy or some other uh, pathology that caused that tube to be removed where they may only have one tube and one ovary, but on opposite sides. And there are case reports that those women do get pregnant. So as a result, we tend to believe that a healthy fallopian tube should be able to obtain the egg from either side. And that's because the fallopian tubes aren't fixed in space, the way we kind of see them in a textbook, right? Where they're just kind of hanging out like this. They're, they're very fluid and they're able to kind of move around in the pelvis. And so as Dr. Clipstein said, because the in humans, the tube isn't kind of wrapped around or connected to that ovary on that given side. We do see that eggs from one ovary can certainly get through the tube of the other side. Excellent. Dr. Rivas? I think your mic is uh, muted. Hello, Natalie. And uh, yeah, it's, this is quite a story. <laughs> and it's great that you're hanging in there. But and and the, and I think this Dr. Clipson just mentioned, if they were in that in the last case that you that you had that you tried to you convert the stimulation to IUI, it's it, it was a versus a zero percent of like either we do something or we don't don't do anything right. So and as uh, Dr. Mikulski just said, the the fallopian tubes are not attached and uh, the eggs can travel. Yes, the percentage is not very high, but it can happen. Mm -hmm. So I think everything that you're doing right now will give you some certain of opportunity to achieve the pregnancy. Uh, you mentioned that you were also in the weight back 
you are going to get prepped for a mini IVF. So the mini IVF is going to give you that same two follicles or maybe another three, like three follicles, and you have to proceed to do all the, the IVF cycle, which would be to retrieve the eggs for the last and, and eventually go and transfer it before and the suggestion will do will be to do a genetic you will know if your embryo that isn't used. Uh, so I encourage you to continue and maybe you just need one one embryo, right? Hopefully you can get it. Um the, the voice quality wasn't that um, clear, uh, Dr. Rivas. Um, maybe, um, maybe I can, uh, we can uh, look at the connection and then maybe uh, have another comment later. Uh, I hope we have heard a little bit of what you said, but not entirely the entire thing. So these patients um, had a history of miscarriages. Natalie, are you, are you still there? Yes. Have you had more than one miscarriage? Yes. So would you guys suggest that she look at uh, a karyotype to see if there is a, any, uh, you know, um, inversion or translocation that, that, that uh, she may be having? Um, uh, no? Yes, uh, definitely. I, I think, you know, the, I would like to know what the um, extra chromosome was um, with the miscarriage, because that would help. I believe it was the 15th. 15, okay. Um, so, uh, yes, I mean, I think the a chromosome analysis for both you and your reproductive partner would be helpful because um, certainly we can get translocations that can cause miscarriages, and we don't know what happened with the two uh, that you had when you were younger, and then you have two ectopics in addition to that, so uh, that would be helpful. Um, I think in addition to that, you might want to do a recurrent pregnancy loss panel, so looking and seeing if there are any autoimmune uh, disorders. Um, and that might be helpful because there's some treatments we can do once you're pregnant to help decrease miscarriage rates. Um, I think, like I said, it was really good that you did the genetic testing of the miscarriage because we know that most likely that was the reason why that one, uh, that pregnancy didn't continue. Um, and whatever you had done, whatever the uterine environment would have been, um, you couldn't have continued that pregnancy. Those trisomy 15, they just don't uh, develop beyond usually the first trimester. Very good. Dr. McCoskey? I absolutely agree. Anytime that we have multiple miscarriages, um, even in instances where we know that in one of them that there may have been a, a chromosomal component, I still think it's worth doing a thorough recurrent miscarriage evaluation. The other thing to touch on is that we talked about how age, we see a number of the, our eggs decline, but we also see the quality diminishing. And while we don't have any tests, unfortunately, for egg quality ahead of time, we tend to think of older, poor quality eggs as almost sort of brittle. And so that way after fertilization occurs and they finish their cell division process of meiosis where they kind of are supposed to spit out the extra DNA that they have sitting in the ovary, they may make mistakes. They may spit out too much DNA or keep pieces they're not supposed to have. And that leads to those chromosomal abnormalities that are most likely gonna result in either an abnormal pregnancy or most commonly, an early miscarriage. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. Rivas, any other comments? I missed the question. I was, uh, I, I lost connection and uh, I think uh, now I'm back. So the question was, uh, because, because Natalie had a few miscarriages in the past, would you recommend a karyotype test in case if she has an inversion or translocation? Well, uh, I think, I think the chances of having an abnormality uh, karyotype on this, this specific, I mean, the chances are low, right? So I think I will recommend more to go and do a PGTA testing on an embryo if they can do an IVF. And of course, this will classify again of a, as, as a panel. I think uh, Dr. Clipston just mentioned about doing a, a recurrent miscarriage panel. And the karyotype is included there. So, yeah, I mean, do the recurrent miscarriage uh, uh, assessment and also do a PGTA testing in your embryo if the IBF is what's next again. 
Very good. Uh, Miriam, uh, can you give us another question from, uh, before we get to another question, Natalie, do you have any remaining concern that you would like to address? Um, I wanted to um, just ask your advice moving forward. I, I see everyone's pretty much on the same page. I did do um, the genetic testing um, before we started our IVF process. Uh, both my partner and I did the Natera uh, carrier screening so that we did do that. Um, and I didn't get any, the only results that were, he was perfect, of course. And I was, um, I think my only result that was, uh, I think this muscular dystrophy, there's like a, I'm a carrier for the gene, um, just off the top of my head. I don't have the results in front of me. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, is that what you mean by the carrier testing? So a karyotype, and I, the, the physician can, can help me clarify that a little bit. The karyotype will tell you if your genetic makeup has any crossover between chromosomes. Usually when that happens, the oocytes or the sperm cells, if it happens in you or in your, in your partner, the sperm cells or the uh, oocytes will have a missing piece of a chromosome or, a, or an extra chromosome, extra piece. And that usually is not, it does not survive. Sometimes it survives just for a few months, but then it'll miscarry by itself because it's not stable. And so the test that you've done is on a carrier panel, just to look at compatibility between you and your husband, whether if you have any inherited mutation. The uh, karyotype is a more of gross uh, changes in the chromosomes. It's a bigger, bigger change than, than a carrier screen. Maybe you guys can help me uh, explain this a little better. Um, I think one of the big things to recognize here, Natalie, is the difference between the gene and the chromosome. So a karyotype is looking is a blood test that's looking at you and your partner's chromosomes. So it's looking at to make sure that you have two copies and only two copies of everything, right? And also making sure that they're not stuck together at all. When we do a carrier screen, we're looking at genes and genes are the pieces that make up the chromosome. So we're looking for particular abnormalities say in muscular dystrophy or cystic fibrosis, where that would be just a piece of a chromosome that's abnormal, but not looking at the overall chromosome. Good. Dr. Clipstein, what advice would you give to, the, to, this, uh, to Natalie going forward? What, what steps should, should she be uh, considering? Yeah, so I, look, I think it's difficult. You've been through so much. And, and the question to ask yourself is, um, you know, which, which direction? You're kind of at this fork uh, in the road. And so on one side is doing another IVF cycle or maybe doing injections of fertility medications with IUI, hoping that the follicles develop on the side that's not blocked. Um, and there are different protocols. There are low responder protocols. As, as Dr. Rivas has mentioned, there's uh, mini IVF. There's all kinds of options that might help. But whatever options you do, you're not going to get a lot of eggs. Um, and so your chance, um, you know, might be lower than somebody else who's 39, um, but has uh, a kind of a more average ovarian reserve. Um, on the other hand, you could think about egg donation, which is a whole different thing to think about. Um, but if the goal is to have a genetic child uh, that's related to you, uh, then I would recommend. And if you say, like, I need to do everything possible before I give up on that hope, um, and there is still, of course, a chance of getting pregnant, I would go in that direction. If you say, look, I'm just so frustrated, I just want a baby, um, then, you know, donor egg is, is a great option, and that chance of success is going to be several fold um, higher um, and maybe less frustrating given everything you've already been through. Um, you've really gone all the way out to try as much as you can to get pregnant with your own eggs, and so it may be time to at least start considering um, kind of your plan B. Thank you so much. Any other comments from uh, from the panel as far as future advice or future step? Ali, I really appreciate you sharing your journey with us. I know it's been quite this you know, long road already. And I think the reality is no answer is going to be the wrong answer. Right. So this is where it becomes really individualized between you and your partner and what your ideal family looks like. And like Dr. Clipstein said, if the um, answer is we just want a baby right now. That might be a different path than we want to keep trying. We want to make sure we haven't left it, you know, any stone unturned, that kind of thing. And also too, we, you know, we live in the real world where unfortunately, depending on where you are in the country, 
IVF may not be covered. And so that places another financial burden on you and your family. So um, I wish you the best um, and you know, hopefully you're on your way to motherhood sooner rather than later. Thank you so much. Dr. Rivas, uh, any final comments before we take the next uh, question? Thank you, Dr. Same, Natalie, you, I think, uh, as far as I can tell, you're with the wish of continuing, and, and I think you should proceed and uh, ask as many questions as you just asked us right now. Same thing with your doctor, talk, talk, and talk until it gets really clear for you, because from that, you will understand, from that, any kind of result will be easier to take. If you understand what you're doing, and if it's very clear for you, then you will. I know that you will be moving forward, and and I wish you the best, of course. Very good. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you so much for bringing your concern to our panel. Thank you, guys. Thank you, um, Riley. We have another question, a live question. Yes, um, our next patient who's asking her question live uh, is Diana. Hi, Diana. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask a question, but it isn't related to age. Is that okay? Okay. Um, I guess one of my um, first questions is my grandmother and my mother had both experienced endometriosis and had it removed from their uterus. And my husband and I have been trying to conceive for um, just shy of two years now with no success. And um, I had a doctor tell me I had no visible signs of endometriosis, um, but that I could have that procedure done where they go in and, and clean out your uterus and look for that. It, is that a step that typically comes um, with people who are diagnosed with unexplained for infertility, um, or is that something that I should look into or ask my doctor about? Thank you so much. Dr. Makowski, we'll start with you now. Sure. Well, thanks for sharing, Diana. Um, endometriosis certainly can cluster in families. There is some belief that there's a degree of kind of genetics that's linked to endometriosis. Um, certainly after trying to conceive for two years, it's time to see a fertility specialist to have a pretty thorough evaluation to, um, and make sure that there really isn't anything else that we can kind of test for to find but to possibly treat. Um, as far as doing I'm not entirely sure which you're asking. So there's laparoscopy, which is a camera in the belly button to look around at the overall pelvis. Um, and then there's hysteroscopy, which is a camera that goes through the vagina, through the cervix, into the uterus. Um, so if we're cleaning out the uterus, that's usually hysteroscopy. If we're evaluating for endometriosis, that's usually laparoscopy. Um, and in certain ways, laparoscopy is a little bit more invasive than hysteroscopy. Um, it usually is done under anesthesia where hysteroscopy could be done in the office. Um, so that's something to consider as far as pros and cons as to whether or not to undergo um, testing for endometriosis. Endometriosis is a surgical diagnosis. So unfortunately, um, it does require having surgery to look around and really find evidence of that endometriosis on tissues in the pelvis and send that tissue off for pathology to confirm that that is in fact what we're seeing when we do surgery. Um, as far as treatment options, if endometriosis is found, that will kind of be something that you and your physician would discuss as far as, depending on kind of the other factors in play, age and semen analysis and how long you've been trying, kind of you know anything else that they've kind of evaluated as to whether or not we would stay with kind of lesser aggressive treatments or if we have really severe endometriosis, if we'd be maybe suggesting something more aggressive like IVF. Very good. Uh, Dr. Rivas? Yes, Diana, hi. Thank you for, for sharing. Uh, I, I got lost a little bit. How old are you? I'm 29 and um, my husband's 31. And just as a background, we've done the HSG test and done his semen analysis. And everything has come back fine. Nothing is showing that we shouldn't be able to get pregnant yet. Um, and we're on. We're waiting to get our first appointment with our uh, fertility specialist. That's. I think that. I think that will clear a lot of questions. And and on my behalf, uh, the unexplained infertility has to be a diagnosed 
uh, given by the fertility specialist. And yes, if you have the history and you're concerned about uh, an endometriosis problems, uh, as as Dr. McCoskey just uh, clear to you how the process is, uh, it's yeah, it's a, it's a surgical procedure, and it will clear out the doubt that you have. And but also there is a more workup that. Uh, probably in the fertility clinic that you visit, you'll have, and maybe another cost can show up. Uh, for sure, when we're dealing with unexplained infertility situation, one of the uh, studies to rule out is the presence of endometriosis. So you might end up doing that kind of assessment to diagnose this and Obviously, in the, in the diagnose will come a treatment because once you're uh, in the abdomen doing the laparoscopy, you might just treat whatever you find and also take samples so you will have a pathology report saying that you actually have or not endometriosis. Uh, the other study that Dr. McCoskey was telling you is a hysteroscopy and that will show you the cavity assessment which also can be a cause of infertility. So uh, I'm very happy that you're moving forward because sometimes people on your age uh, decide to wait. And then it's 33 and then it's 34 and then we receive them at 37. Uh, so I think it's a very good thing that you're moving forward and, and clear out all these doubts. Thank you so much. Dr. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Rivas. I mean, of course, we want you to come to treatment uh, as early as possible because as we all sort of said, um, age is really important. And Diana, I'm glad you're starting when you're so young. Um, but the question is, why are you not getting pregnant? And so a couple comments. Um, with endometriosis, sometimes we can get an inkling that there's endometriosis on an ultrasound. So if you haven't had that yet, um, sometimes you can see these cysts that are very typical for what we call endometriomas. And um, and when we see those, then we're, we're much higher, uh, much more suspicious that, um, that there's endometriosis. Um, the other part of your question that I think um, Dr. Murkowski and I were kind of wondering about, uh, and I can tell by how she answered the question, is that you know, you, endometriosis usually isn't in the uterus per se, not on the inside of the uterus. Um, having said that, doing a hysteroscopy to look inside the uterus may be helpful if there's any abnormality there. So I am glad you did the HSG and you saw that at least... Um, by that, there is no abnormality in the uterus, and also that the tubes weren't blocked because sometimes endometriosis can cause tubal blockage. Um, and then, of course, endometriosis um, uh, can, in, relating a little bit to, to, to Natalie's uh, question, endometriosis can cause diminished ovarian reserves. So you definitely want to know all these things. But I do think, um, as Dr. Riva said, when you go to your fertility doctor, doing some hormones, um, looking at the reproductive hormones, and doing an ultrasound will give you a whole lot of information and help guide you in terms of what the next steps might be. Um, and yes, you do have a family history of endometriosis, but I guess my question is, do you have a lot of pain with your cycles, a lot of pelvic pain? Is that something that you're suffering from, Diana? Yeah, I had originally suffered from it, and then I went on um, the shot for birth control because my doctor um, and my, a different doctor I saw, I, we have moved across the country since this doctor, but they had suggested that I go on birth control because um, we weren't actively trying at the time. And he said, if I have endometriosis, I could uh, slow the growth by going on birth control. So at that time I had gone on the shot and I had since gone off of it. And I've been off of that shot um, for just shy of two years now. And um, that had minimized my pain greatly and it's just starting to return in the past three months it's um I can't stand sometimes when it's like that but when I had one ultrasound they did say there were no visible signs of endometriosis so I think that that's probably a good thing yeah, that is a good thing but you still very well may have endometriosis and your symptoms seem to suggest that so that is something to look at now endometriosis doesn't necessarily have to be fixed you don't necessarily have to have surgery there are fertility treatments we can do um, that will work around the endometriosis. So um, surgery isn't the only option, but I'm sure once you talk with your fertility doctor um, and address all of your history and your concerns, um, you'll discuss a list of possible directions and, and kind of an order of which way to go. So uh, best of luck to you and uh, 
uh, we hope to hear good news very soon. Um, Diana, have you seen a fertility specialist yet or are you with an OBGYN right now? Just in the past um, week, I have reached out to my OB to get my referral. So I'm waiting for the office to call and set up my appointment. Um, but I have been on letrozole for three months with my OB and doing the HSG and some preliminary stuff. Um, and nothing has been successful for us yet. So we're going to go ahead and move to a specialist now. Yeah. And you guys would suggest that as a recommendation? What's yeah. that? I was asking the physicians yeah. if that would be a recommendation for for you to to seek a physical physician. Absolutely. Yes. Very good. Yeah, of course. Um, We're a little bit biased, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> Diana, do you have any other question? Um, a million, but I'll let it go to somebody else. <laughs> Thank you, though. Very good. Very good. Thank you so much, Diana, for your questions. Uh, thank you for coming in for, for, for this consultation. Uh, uh, Miriam, can you take a couple of questions that were asked and submitted to us? Yeah, sure. Um, the first question comes from Dahlia. She's 38 years old and she's been trying to conceive naturally. Uh, no, I apologize. So she was able to conceive naturally and has a five-year-old. Um, she had several fol follicles in preparation for retrieval and only eight eggs were retrieved and none of them made it for transfer. So her IVF success was unfortunately not successful. So she asks, what is the average amount of eggs to be retrieved during an IVF cycle? Um, and I will ask uh, this time, Dr. Rivas, this is your turn. Thank you. Uh, what is the average amount of eggs to be retrieved during an IVF cycle? That's the question, right? Yes. Okay. So in the ideal world, the, 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 you have to retrieve a certain amount of eggs, but also you have to have maturity in those eggs, right? So, and depends on the age of the patient. So uh, the more eggs I can have on an elderly person, patient, the better. Uh, not so much for a very young uh, couple. So the one that you told me was 38 years old, correct? Yes. Okay. So the 38 year old woman, it will be really good to have 10 to 12 mature eggs. That's a, that's a number that will give us around uh, three to three to four embryos. Okay. And then we do, we need to go and assess the quality of these embryos. So that's, a, that's the ideal world. And I don't know if for a 30-year-old with a low ovarian reserve and probably with a low response, response from the ovaries, then this can get very complicated. And, uh, and yes, she, I think you told me she had a five-year-old. So that's a good sign. That's a good sign of if it's from the same couple, uh, that she can like there's a lot of good positive things in in this case because she already achieved a spontaneous pregnancy with same couple that means that the ovary the egg was good the sperm was good then the cavity respond and all this so uh every cycle can be different from each other so i will encourage this patient to do it again and probably this time the stimulation is better and we can achieve this number of nine to ten mature eggs because she already gave eight so it's it's unfortunately can get to this point but with another cycle I, I'm, hopefully she can get, do better i mean more information is needed but eight eggs on the first cycle let's analyze a little bit more of uh, the the males sample all the factors and hopefully give her a better um, result because I think she can achieve it. Very good. Uh, we have a few more questions. So I think we're gonna, to, to be able to cover all the questions, we're gonna just give one question to, his, his, to each uh, physician. Um, Miriam, can you please read the second question for uh, Dr. Clipsy? Sure. Um, so our next patient is 41 years old. Uh, she's been trying to conceive naturally for a year. 
And she asked what should the next steps be for trying to conceive and then what are her chances to become pregnant naturally at her age. And once again, she's 41 years old. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, it's, uh, as we said, harder to get pregnant as we get older. Um, in the early 40s, about half of women will have trouble getting pregnant. So you're in good company, uh, unfortunately. And uh, while we always like to look at age as a first uh, factor, but we don't know that that is the only factor. And so I think it's hard to say just because you're 41 and just because you've tried for a year that age is the only issue. So I, really the, the first step I would recommend is do an evaluation, look at the ovarian reserve. Is it better or worse as we expect for your age? Uh, check if the tubes are open, um, check if your partner's sperm is normal um, and check that there's not anything in the uterus that might be preventing you from getting pregnant. So those are the next steps. And then once you have all of that information, then you can uh, come up with a game plan of what the next treatment is. Um, if you don't want to do any of that and you're just asking what the chance of success is, um, in a 41-year-old who's been trying for a year without success, the monthly chance of pregnancy is a couple percent, maybe 2%, 3%. Um, that's what you would expect if you did nothing. Thank you so much. Uh, Miriam, can you take one more question for Dr. Nikolsky? Yes. Um, our next question is a genetics question. Um, the patient asks for what are the chances of women below 35 years old with diminished ovarian reserve to have euploid embryos? I think in a patient you said who's under 35? Yes. Under 35, I think you have a great chance of still having a euploid embryo, if not embryos. Um, so having diminished ovarian reserve is really just diagnosed based on markers, right? So the markers of ovarian reserve that we use are antral follicle count with that baseline ultrasound, our AMH, um, and looking at the brain making FSH and the ovary responding by making estradiol. And so each of those and all of those together even are just markers. So they're not predictive of chances of success, of chances of live birth. Um, they really are just the tools that we use to help determine what type of protocol we may wanna use, what type of medicines we think may be best. Um, but having those same markers of ovarian reserve that show diminished ovarian reserve at 33, 34, are gonna be a different prognosis than having the exact same numbers at 41, 42. And that's because as we talked about earlier, not only does the number of our eggs decline as we get older, but the quality diminishes. So we're still having relatively good quality eggs, just predictive of age alone, under the age of 35 compared to say, you know, in the 40s. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ash, I think you're muted. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have one live question. Uh, Riley, can you take that question for us? Yes. Hi, uh, Veronica. Veronica is our last patient who will ask question live. Hi, Veronica. Hi there. Hi. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm 40 years old, and I've been through this IBF journey for quite a while now. Um, I've had IVF in Mexico, and then for the first time this year, I had it um, here in the United States. Um, and I had two embryos um, come back abnormal. And I'm just curious about the genetic testing. I mean, is it worth me getting it done at my age? Um, I just want to hear and pick your brains and see what you all might think of that. And I was curious about um, doctor, you were talking about the karyotype test. Um, I'm curious about that one as well. Very good. Uh, Dr. Clifton? Yeah, Veronica, thanks for your question. So um, I think, you know, it's a difficult question whether to do genetic testing or not. Um, I would say in the 40s, I tend to err on the side of doing it for several reasons. One, you have a higher percentage of embryos that are going to be chromosomally abnormal, uh, as you found out with the two that you have. Um, and so it takes a lot more embryos to get one that's normal. However, once you find one that's normal, that chance of success of that embryo uh, implanting is about 70%, which is the same as, as a woman of any age having an embryo implant. The, the risk I see by not testing um, is that 
if you had implanted those abnormal embryos, they may have not implanted and, and you wouldn't have sort of lost anything. I guess in a way you would have gotten the same result just by transferring them um, and then not spending the time and the money on, on getting the results. On the other hand, if one of those embryos had implanted and you had gotten pregnant and then you had miscarried, you would have lost a valuable two or three or four months before you can try again. And so I think that's really the value of doing genetic testing um, as you get into your 40s, uh, and even the late 30s. Uh, doing a karyotype on you, I think, wouldn't hurt. It might inform uh, what the chance is of uh, having chromosomally abnormal embryos, um, but we know that at age 40, that chance of having having those is, is high already. And if you're already doing the genetic testing, um, then um, it doesn't add as much to do the karyotype, but, but certainly somewhat. And if the blood test is fairly easy to do. So um, I would definitely recommend doing that. Um, but I would also recommend, you know, regardless of what the karyotype shows, doing another cycle with the genetic testing. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Makowski, would you recommend uh, some sort of banking since the patient is 40 so try to get as many eggs as possible and then test. So what, what, would you, what would be your recommendation how she could strategize to get the best of her, of her treatment? Absolutely. Well, thank you, Veronica, for sharing. And I'm sorry to hear about your two failed cycles um, thus far, uh, but it, it does give us a lot of information. Um, and then in regards to your karyotype question, um, I would be more inclined to recommend that if both of those embryos had the same chromosome that were affected. Um, as far as whether or not I would recommend embryo banking, this is where, again, it becomes really individualized. So it would be kind of to what extent do we want to grow your family? Are we looking at adding just one more? Are we looking at adding one of a particular gender? Are we looking at adding multiple children over the next few years? Uh, because in those cases, again, back to the um, idea that you know, we're not gonna have any more eggs and they're not gonna ever be better quality. And we wanna capitalize on that now as much as we can. So that way, hopefully after success of the first pregnancy, we have embryos available of good quality um, for the future. Okay. Thank you so much. Dr. Rivas, uh, any comments on these two questions? Thank you, thank you. Um... Thank you for sharing. And I think you, you, I, I think it was you, Dr. Neville, that mentioned about the number of X. And obviously, uh, the more X we can have, the more embryos we can test. So it's a matter of finding the correct embryo. And Dr. Mikowski, you're saying about the banking uh, embryos. And that's what it's about, right? to search for the normal embryo. And at the end, uh, we don't know when it's going to show up. Probably can be in the next cycle, right? Probably it's going to be two cycles more. So uh, I think in order to continue, you just need to, uh, as Dr. Mikowski was saying, to think about uh, wh which path am I, am I going to choose? If it's the banking embryos, yes, is to find the correct embryo. And once you find it, go and try the embryo transfer. But I encourage you to, to do that, Veronica, and, and uh, I think you can find it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Do you have any other question for the physicians? Um, no, that was um, pretty much it. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for participating and for bringing your concern. Thanks, Veronica. Um, we're gonna take um, uh, two questions uh, that were asked on the chat before we go into additional questions. And uh, I think we're gonna try to just pass one question to each physician. This way we can cover as many as possible. The next question was, can, uh, can someone talk about PCOS and how that affects the air quality and the number of eggs. And I think we could uh, uh, start with you, Dr. Makoski, this time. Um, so PCOS is a very complex disorder um, and there's a lot of factors that come into play. Um, I think one of the biggest factors that's gonna have an impact is gonna be, again, age, right? So if we're talking about a PCOS patient at 29 versus a PCOS patient at 39, we're gonna be looking at kind of a, a different idea from the get-go, right? Because again, we're gonna be looking at, even if there's a high number of eggs, 
the quality of those eggs is still diminishing as we get older. Um, so I think that that's something that we're contending with. Now, if we're looking at a young PCOS patient, again, someone that may be in their 20s, our stimulation protocols might be a little bit different. So we're really trying to get better quality eggs over necessarily a high number of eggs. Um, so again, it's going to be very individualized depending on the person who is presenting with PCOS. Thank you so much. Mayim, can you take the second question on the chat? Yes. Um, another question that we've received is what causes low AMH in women less than 35 years old? And uh, that would be uh, Dr. Rivas, if you want to address that question. Thank you. Causes of lowering AMH below 35. Well, you can you can start with uh, endometriosis can be another causes. You can you can we can start searching about causes, genetic ca causes, uh, chromosomal abnormalities, mostly systems. Uh, that's something to be assessed. Uh, autoimmune response, and um, and endometriosis. That would be the biggest groups. Obviously, surgeries that these patients might have. Uh, surgeries on the pelvic area, on the uh, ovaries, cyst removals that they have, they might have experience. Every intervention can can give us a, a demit, can lower our ovarian reserve. And there's the then there is a group of unexplained, right? Uh, as uh, and and that's a group that I I will. I'll ask the rest of the physicians, but that's a thing that it's happening a little bit more, don't you think? We're looking at more younger people with lower, like lower ovarian reserve when normally that wasn't the case. Now more people around the 34, 35 year old, uh, which normally they were not our group of concern of low ovarian reserve, now they're showing that. So. I think it's also a combination of multi-factors that nowadays we're experiencing, right? The, the epigenetics of what we are exposed that can damage and that we can, and we can, we don't know the full explanation of this, uh, but definitely run tests on morphology of the ovaries, run tests, hormonals, run tests to, through genetics to look at the cause. Sometimes we might find it and sometimes we won't. Thank you so much. Uh, Miriam, can you take the, the, the third question on the chat? Uh, yes. Uh, our next question is, how many times should one try IVF before giving up? Uh, the age, the, the context is missing there. Um, uh, but I think Dr. Clipstein maybe can add some context. Um, yeah, it's it's a really difficult question. I think, as Dr. Mikowski has said, this is so individualized, and uh, a lot of it depends on your sort of emotional energy and your financial resources and how the cycles have gone. So if someone's doing really well uh, with one or two IVF cycles but hasn't gotten pregnant but has great ovarian reserve and nice embryos, uh, certainly it makes sense to try again. Uh, if someone's made one or two embryos that are poor quality or no embryos, I think that's a different uh, circumstance. Um, there have been studies looking at whether you have decreased chance of success with each subsequent IVF cycle, and that actually doesn't seem to be the case. And in fact, I would say the opposite, because oftentimes we learn a lot from that first IVF cycle. What works, what doesn't, what can we tweak? Um, so the first cycle sometimes really informs the next cycles. Um, and it's not until the fourth or fifth or sixth cycle uh, where you see diminishing returns and, and lower chance of success. So, so sometimes people ask me, well, if I don't get pregnant in the first cycle, am I more likely to get pregnant on the second? Not necessarily, but you're certainly not less likely to get pregnant on the second or the third or even the fourth. And unfortunately, um, a lot of this is uh, statistics and it's odds and you have to hope that you're on the right side of the, uh, of the odds. And uh, sometimes it takes a little time to get there. So uh, I certainly would say one IVF cycle is not enough to make a, a determination whether it's going to work or not. Um, but it really depends on all of these factors put together, and it's very hard um, to say kind of in a general sense what the right number of cycles are. Um, I guess until you get pregnant is the right answer, but um, so, so many much. factors to think about. Yep. Thank you so much. 
Uh, Miriam, can you take maybe another, maybe three questions? And with that, we will uh, wrap up the, the webinar. Uh, one question for each physician. I think we are pretty close to the end of the webinar now. Sure. Um, we just received a question from Jennifer. She's 41 years old and she was diagnosed with PCOS in her 20s. She says that she's been on birth control for years and she got off birth control five years ago and her cycle has never been normal. Uh, she said that her fertility doctor says she doesn't think that she has active PCOS. Um, she also states that she has high ovarian reserve for her age. Um, however, when she went through her IVF cycle, her doctor did say that she has poor egg quality. She had 14 eggs that were retrieved, six were mature and three fertilized, and none of those eggs made it past day five. So she asks if her treatment, if, she, uh, if her treatment should account for her PCOS. Thank you so much. Um, and I will open this question to anyone who wanted to start first. I don't mind answering since I talked about PCOS with the last question. Um, I think all of the factors need to be taken into account. Um, again, PCOS is a very complex disorder. It's multifactorial and it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So there are a lot of things that can masquerade as PCOS. Um, so it's hard to know what criteria were actually used 20 years ago when this patient was diagnosed with PCOS. Um, I think obviously having her good ovarian reserve at 41, we've got 14 eggs with an IVF cycle. Um, there's certainly a strong possibility that the patient's a PCOS patient. Um, so it should definitely be accounted for as far as you know her planning, as far as treatments, as far as protocols, um, and something to consider with the potential with the poor ovarian, um, the poor egg quality one of the things that we're seeing in women with PCOS um, are issues with inositol, um, which is um, essentially kind of a hormone that has an impact on um, insulin levels and glucose metabolism. And so sometimes the kind of ratios of um, myo-inositol and d inositol can be a bit imbalanced in women with PCOS, and that can contribute to poor egg quality as well. Um, so potentially being on a supplement in a 40 to 1 ratio might be something that could be beneficial. Very good. Um, we have potentially one more patient who wanted to ask Clyde. Uh, Riley, can you see if, if Jennifer can get connected? Hey, Jennifer. Are you able to hear us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. yes perfect. Thank you so much. So um, thank you for the answer, uh, Dr. I was, I was kind of curious around... Um, my cycles have been normal, I, and so my doctor said that I, I she shouldn't account for the PCOS. But like I said, I did have um, you know a lot of um, a quite n a number of eggs retrieved, but none really made it past. Two, she said that two of them um, had uh, additional chromosomes in them, so that's why they that that there are only three that survived through day three. Then they all just kind of slow down after. Uh, day three. Um, so, based on what you just said, is there something that sh I should that I should do or ask my doctor to do to evaluate my condition further to make sure that uh, the PCOS isn't um, deterring me from having success? Hi, Jennifer. Thanks for sharing. Um, I think at this stage, PCOS is probably not the highest. Thing on the list of things that are going on that's contributing to the failed success rate in this cycle. Um, as we've been talking about the entire webinar, right, that the number of eggs decline as we get older. So you may have started off with essentially a, you know, a fizzier Coke from the get-go, so it's not as flat at 41 as say maybe your peers have, um, but that the quality of those remaining eggs is lower as well than it was in our 20s. And so unfortunately, we don't have any tests with current technology to assess egg quality up front. And with mm -hmm. that, we don't have any really good treatments to improve egg quality. So there has been some, um, some studies and they're kind of poor at best looking at certain supplements like DHEA, CoQ10, myo-inositol that show that there may be improvement, um, but certainly nothing definitive. Unfortunately, the only way to really boost egg quality is to use younger eggs because statistically they're going to be better quality. 
Um, but I don't think that means necessarily giving up since you've had a good number of eggs, just unfortunately that have resulted in aneuploid or genetically abnormal embryos. Um, it doesn't mean that there aren't some good quality eggs in there that can result in healthy embryos. Okay. Thank you very much. It's very helpful. Uh, Dr. Clifton, would you add something to what Dr. Mikulski had said? You know, I agree with everything she said. I, I would say it's really an interesting phenomenon. We see this not infrequently where young women have PCOS in very irregular cycles. And as their ovaries kind of um, lose their eggs. So, so with PCOS, you have a lot of follicles and the follicles just aren't ovulating and so you have these irregular cycles. Over time, as the follicles are lost, which is a natural process with aging, um, you see that the cycles become more normal. And so the PCOS in a way sort of solves itself over time. And so I agree with Dr. Mikowski that while the PCOS might have been an issue um, had you tried to get pregnant in your 20s right now, the issue is really age and, and decreased egg quality. And so those are the things that we really need to focus on. And in fact, the history of PCOS probably led you to have more eggs now than you might have uh, had you not had the PCOS. So in a way, it was almost protective. Um, and so I, I agree, uh, trying again would make sense, especially since you're getting a good number of, of eggs with your IVF cycle. And uh, you know, if you can get them to, to go to the blastocyst phase and test them genetically, um, that would give you very good information and hopefully guide you as to whether to transfer or not. But I think you're in a in a relatively good place, and, and I think the PCOS has not necessarily harmed you, it might have actually helped you a little bit uh, getting to this point in time. Yeah, and I, I would just add that uh, based on statistics, and we have tested more than 30,000 embryos from different ages, and at, at 41, 42, you have about 25% chance of having a normal embryo. So if you have a large number of uh, of eggs that are fertilized, there is a chance you can get some good embryos there, uh, just based on statistics. Um, Dr. Rivas, would you add something to, to the questions? Uh, thank you, and thank you, Jennifer, for sharing. Uh, yeah, I think I have to agree with the plan is right now. It's repeat, you have the numbers, uh, probably reassess your couple sample uh, booth, uh, take care of other factors that can that can that can come into play once you uh, do an IVF before that. So, and repeat it. You have the numbers, the percentage that Dr. Nabi just mentioned. Uh, it's a twenty-five percent, so it's a decent percent if you can have the numbers and if you can achieve the embryo. So, yeah, as uh, Dr. Clifton was mentioning, how, how many IVF cycles are the good? amount probably yours is the next one okay so uh yeah hang in there and continue thank you so much uh maybe we can get uh um one or or two questions and then we will wrap up uh Miriam, if you can read from your list sure uh claudia asks if she is 45 44 years old uh why is it that she can't use her own eggs during treatment I think we've gone through this question a few times. Uh, do you guys want to add something or should we uh, and go to the next question? Uh, let's, let's look at the well, next th Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Rivas, mm -hmm. go ahead. I, I think just to, just to make sure, it's not that the clinic, well, the clinic does not want to work with your ex. It's probably that the advice is different, right? Uh, the method of you trying it is or the advice to not use any is for you to realize that the percentage of success is very low. But uh, sometimes uh, the patient can just try it and see if they can find the normal embryo there, since we don't have a zero percent. Yeah. I just want to mention that, thank you. Very good, thank you so much. One last question, I'm gonna take it just from the chat and with this we'll wrap up the webinar. Uh, someone was asking uh, why uh, someone would have a miscarriage with an egg donor. And uh, I'll take you uh, this question to Dr. Makoski, maybe. Sure. Um, so there's lots of causes of miscarriage in anyone, right? So we talked about genetic abnormalities or aneuploidies. Um, and they're the most common cause of miscarriage at any age. So even if you're using eggs from a young donor who's maybe in their early 20s, 
it doesn't eliminate the risk of there being an aneuploid embryo. There's also other factors, hormonal, um, endocrine, anatomic issues that may be at play that could negatively impact ability to get or stay pregnant, um, as well as kind of clotting disorders and other immunologic things. So um, I think it'd be really important to discuss with your doctor um, whether or not you had done testing of the embryos for aneuploidy ahead of time and what additional testing they may offer you um, to evaluate for causes of miscarriage. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to give you guys a couple of minutes to introduce um, your practice um, and tell us how, what you do for your patients and how do you do it. Uh, um, and I will start uh, uh, with Dr. Clipstein. Um, okay, thank you very much. So I'm with Invia Fertility Specialists and we're um, in Chicago, suburban Chicago. Um, we are really full service. We pride ourselves on being relatively small and um, a little boutique in the sense that we try to you know, cater uh, all of our treatments to the individual patients, which I'm, I think all of us do. Um, I know all of us do. Um, the, we have our own egg donor program. We recruit egg donors. We do surrogacy. We do um, you know, genetic testing. We do a lot of embryo testing, uh, both for chromosomes and for single gene disorders. And uh, I'd love to welcome anybody who wants to come our way and uh, who we can help. Thanks for the opportunity to be here on this panel. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Dr. Rivas. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Dr. Nabil, for this uh, well, webinar. And we're located uh, in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, in, the, in a region called Punta Mita. We're part of the Center for Reproductive Health and Gynecological, which is located in Beverly Hills. And we are the we are a branch from this center. And as Dr. Um, Clips had just mentioned, we're a boutique clinic with all the services, same services as Dr. Gibson mentioned: egg donation, surrogacy, semen bank. Um, and we're very used to work with patients from other places, not just Mexico. Uh, we have a platform to do virtual consultations and uh, workups on the distance. Uh, we treat most of the times our patients are from abroad and um, happy to treat every single patient as an individual and uh, walk with them through the journey. Through the journey. Thank you very much, Dr. Nabil. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Dr. Makowski. Yes, thanks again for inviting me to be part of this panel. So I'm Sarah Mikowski. I'm double board certified in OBGYN and reproductive endocrinology and infertility, and I'm with Dallas IVF. Um, I office then in Dallas, Texas. Uh, we have uh, five different locations throughout the Metroplex, and all of our doctors are also double board certified. Um, I personally am kind of in a hybrid practice where I have some degree of academic involvement with Baylor University. Uh, so it's really nice to be able to stay kind of on top of the literature as well as teach residents and med students. Um, we're also, you know, not a private equity practice. We're more of a boutique practice um, that's physician run and operated and we are entirely full service. Um, so we have lots of different options as far as kind of you know, less aggressive options to more aggressive options, non-traditional family building, um, egg freezing, you name it, we're here to take care of everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, well, with this, we're coming to the end of the webinar today. Next week, we will, um, on Wednesday, uh, 3 p.m. Pacific time, we will have uh, a, uh, a comprehensive review of country system, that, that the, the, the uh, discussion around how the embryos are being cultured and how the fertilization happened in, in the lab. We will have uh, about 12 lab directors, laboratory directors from all ac across the country. So if you are curious to know how your embryos will be growing uh, in the petri dish and how, you know, labs handle these uh, embryos, you are welcome to attend next week. Thank you so much for our panel. I would like to extend my gratitude and, and appreciation for your support and for your help in clarifying questions for, for our patients. Thank you so much. We will see you next week. Thank you.